In this video, we're going to talk about the science of memory. Descriptions of memory often start by differentiating between short-term and long-term, but I prefer to start by describing the different types of information we might hold in our memory. Semantic memory refers to things that are factual, like the types of things you might be forced to remember in your history courses. Procedural memory tends to be more instinctual and involves things like riding a bike. In fact, that's where the expression it's like riding a bike you never forget comes from. Even if you forget the what, you never forget the how. And then there's autobiographical memories like your name and where you were born and how you felt when you had your first kiss and things like that. This is also referred to as episodic memory. This also reveals a very important insight about memory loss. Often when people suffer from retrograde amnesia, it's not the case that all memories are lost. In fact, the character Jason Bourne says this explicitly. He says he can't remember his name or who he is, but he knows how to assess whether a situation is dangerous and how to fight his way out of it as necessary. And this is not limited to amnesia. Semantic memory is actually preserved in early stage Alzheimer's disease. What about other types of amnesia where people can't form new memories? This is referred to as enterograde amnesia. But still, even in a case like this, other memory types remain intact. There is a well-known case of someone with anterograde amnesia who can't form new memories working with a researcher who asked him to draw a picture based on a reflection in the mirror. Each time this person introduced himself to the researcher because he had no memory of the researcher or the task, but he did gradually get better at drawing the image. Why? Because of procedural memory. Now we come to a discussion about the different memory processes rather than types. Sensory memory is just the length of time that something stays in your perceptual field. If I show you an image and then remove it, the image will remain as a sensation in your visual field for a very brief period of time before dissolving. Short-term memory lasts a bit longer and has to do with completing tasks, which is why it's sometimes referred to as working memory. So for example, if I asked you to multiply some numbers together without using a paper or calculator, you'd have to remember what those numbers are in order to work with them. And you're not going to remember those numbers a week from now. Thinking back just a minute ago with the sensory example of the image that gets shown and then removed, if someone were to ask you 30 minutes from now what the image was, you won't have the exact image I showed you in your perceptual field, but you can probably recall it by conjuring the image internally as part of your memory but you won't remember it 10 years from now if someone asks you the same question. And that's the real difference between short-term and long-term memory. Long-term memory is potentially limitless. Everything you remember from the past is in your long-term memory. Of course, as time passes, it can become more difficult to remember specific things, especially if you don't think about them very much. This explains why you don't remember most of the things you learn in school, even if you're a very strong student. I did pretty well in school, and yet I don't remember what the quadratic formula is or what it's used for. Your textbook describes a phenomenon identified in the 1950s as a magical number seven, plus or minus two. That's the upper limit of numerical digits we can hold in our memory on average, and that this is the rationale behind limiting phone numbers to seven digits long. But this isn't actually correct. Turns out the reason we can hold phone numbers in working memory is not because of the magical number seven, it's because of chunking. We group letters and numbers together so that we can handle large numbers of digits as a small number of chunks. So we have area codes, and then we have the first three digits and then the last four digits of the phone number. Now, how do we commit things to memory? That is, how do we remember stuff that we want to remember? How do we get stuff into our long-term memory storage? The first part of this process is called encoding. Often it's automatic and requires very little, if any, effort. We remember things all the time that stick. I remember when my daughter was born, when my wife and I got married, and I remember when she got her cancer diagnosis and her first chemo treatments. Would I rather not have those memories? Well, that's a complicated question. I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of painful memories and whether or not they actually serve us. This is the plot of some other films as well, like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. But what about some things we definitely want to remember, like semantic stuff? Maybe you meet someone at a networking event and you really want to remember their name. Are there tricks to remember stuff that we wouldn't automatically get? Yes. 
and let's talk about those tricks. First, we have rehearsal. This is basically just repeating stuff over and over again. And it's a very popular strategy. People use it all the time for things like, for example, in, in academic content. And it can work well, but usually only for short periods of time, which is fine if you're cramming for an exam, but not for much else. In fact, this is sometimes referred to as the testing effect because repetition is good for doing well on exams and quizzes. Deeper thinking really facilitates long-term memory. This is when you don't just repeat something or think about trivial aspects of it, but really try to connect it to stuff that's already deep in your memory. Some studies with vocabulary words will have participants be randomly assigned to be told to think about the definition of the word, while others are told to think about trivial stuff like the font that the words are printed in, and others are told to think about it on a deeper level, like whether the words would describe you personally. The last strategy tends to work the best. Your textbook mentions the process of recoding, which is our way of making associations between the new information and things we already know. These associations then become the framework for our ability to retrieve that information. This is sometimes referred to as mnemonic devices. And you've probably used this strategy too in school. For example, the mathematical order of operations mnemonic, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, or PEMDAS. And speaking of mnemonic devices, another good encoding strategy is to use vivid imagery. If you use flashcards, each word or idea should have memorable images for each one. This is the principle behind the app Memrise, which is a foreign language vocabulary builder. It's about pairing ideas with images because images are easier to retain in memory. All right, now we're going to do an exercise together. What's going to happen is I'm going to read a list of words, and I want you to see how many you can hold in your memory. So stop whatever you're doing, put down your device or paper, or whatever you've got, and just listen to the word list. And then after I'm done with the list, I'll say go, and you write down as many as you can remember, okay? Ready, set, here's the list. Dark, drowsy, tired, sheets, narcolepsy, blanket, moon, pajamas, yawning, kangaroo, pillow, exhausted, midnight, stars, bed, nighttime. All right, pause the video and write them down. Go. If you haven't paused the video, please do so now because I'm going to move on. All right. Now, how many of you got these words, dark and drowsy? Those were the first two words on the list. If you recalled them, as many people tend to be able to do, that's because of the primacy effect. The primacy effect is basically our tendency to remember things that are at the beginning of a list. If you recalled bed or nighttime, this shows the recency effect. Those were the last two words on the list. The recency effect is basically the inverse of the primacy effect. If you remembered kangaroo, this is because of the distinctiveness effect. We're more likely to remember things that stand out, that are unusual, that we don't normally encounter. Last one, did you get sleep and dream? Those are examples of the priming effect. And I fooled you because those words weren't actually on the list. If you go back and listen to it again, you will see that sleep and dream are not spoken. The priming effect basically refers to the idea that I activated a schema, a mental representation of sleep and dream by saying words that are conceptually related to those concepts. So we tend to associate sleep and dream with dark, drowsy, tired, blanket, moon, pajamas, yawning, etc. So even though I didn't say those words, you thought you remembered them because they're conceptually related to the other words. This also shows the fallibility of memory, which we'll talk about more in a couple of minutes. And this graph shows the primacy and recency effects at work. So as you can see, in the beginning of a word list, memory recall tends to be high, and then it dips in the middle, and then it goes back up again towards the end. This, the primacy effect happens because there's less interference at the beginning. All you need to do is focus on the initial information without any other competing information. Recency effects happen because there's less decay. There's less time between getting the information and needing to recall it. 
poor middle children in the middle get forgotten. And the primacy versus recency effects lead nicely into our next topic, which is that of memory storage. Part of the reason that we can or can't remember things is because of the retention interval or the time between when we learn something and when we need to recall it. Anything else that happens during the retention interval can interfere with remembering. This is called retroactive interference. There's also a phenomenon called the misinformation effect, which is what happens when things happen after you learn something that essentially tamper with memory storage. This is especially important to consider in the context of eyewitness testimony, and your textbook chapter mentions this explicitly. Some people might see or hear things like, for example, a car crash, but then they'll listen to other people recount their memories of what they saw and heard, and that might interfere with our own memories. This is one of the reasons why eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, especially in criminal cases. And not only that, but activities that happen before the retention interval can also interfere. Imagine that your boyfriend or girlfriend dumps you and then you have to go to math class and learn formulas to remember for a test. That's going to be very difficult because the emotional stuff from earlier is interfering proactively. So as I mentioned a minute ago, memory is unreliable. Much of the memory's integrity is dependent on the retention interval. The concept of misinformation and eyewitness testimony is based on a really fundamental principle of memory, which is that when we recall things from memory, that process is reconstructive. In other words, recalling a memory is not like looking at a photograph or reading from a text, neither of which will change if you look at them again and again. But looking inward in our own memories is a process of rebuilding the thing you're trying to remember. The mere act of remembering itself is an active process. Available memories are the ones that have been encoded and stored, but not necessarily accessible to us all the time. You may forget something today, but then remember it tomorrow. If you remember something later on that you can't remember now, that shows that something that is available in your memory, but not immediately accessible. A good example of this would be the tip of the tongue phenomenon, where you kind of know that you remember it, but you can't actually remember it in the moment. Retrieval cues are sometimes environmental and sometimes state dependent. For example, if you're trying to remember something you learned while it was raining out, you're more likely to remember it on a rainy day, or if you're primed to think about when it rained before. You're also more likely to remember something that you learned while sad if you're actually feeling sad now. This is sometimes referred to as the encoding specificity principle about how retrieval ability is guided by encoding processes. While this wraps up this video on memory, please check out the others I've posted from YouTube, including an interview with the famous memory researcher, Elizabeth Loftus.